Welcome to the Education Law Association's podcast on technology and copyright. I'm Justin Bathin. I'm a professor at the University of Kentucky in the Educational Leadership Studies Department. And during this podcast, I'll provide you a brief overview of the law of technology and copyright and some concerns arising therein. Now, to tell the story of technology and copyright, I actually want to provide a story and give some background and move that into some concerns that we're having in technology and copyright issues with education right now and then provide some tips for practice. So first off my story, the story is not mine, it's actually of this man, Lawrence Lessig, a professor at Harvard. Lawrence Lessig did a peculiar thing. He took our standard conception of copyright, which is a C with a circle around it, and he added a C to it. <laughs> which is a very odd story. So before we get to it, let me provide you a bit of background. Okay, so why copyright in the first place? Why do we have this thing? Well, we need to go all the way back to the beginning. And when we go back to the beginning in education law, that means we go back to the Constitution. And in this document, there's a particular clause that is of importance. It's Article 1, Section 8, that Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So there you go. For a limited time, we're going to offer some copyright. So that's the general concept in that you take an author like Mr. Hemingway here and you provide incentives for him to produce more great ideas. Generally, at the end of this, our country is better off. That's the concept. Historically, you can see that we have extended the term of copyright uh, from the original conception of around 14 years all the way up now to 120 years. Um, and in 1976, we added this thing called fair use, and so we got rid of the renewal provision and just provided the full term of copyright at that point uh, for 76 years and now all the way up to 120 years with the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act of 1998. So fair use, what is this thing? So what we say is that it's very difficult, if we're going to protect everything in this country, it's going to be very difficult for us to function because we're going to be suing each other all the time. So we're going to allow some flexibility in what gets used under copyright. And so if the use is relatively small and doesn't have much harmful effect, it's fair use. We're going to overlook it. And so we look at the purpose and the character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount of the work that gets used, and its market effect. And if all of those things are relatively small, courts usually just don't care and they stay out of it. So one of the issues we've had though is that we're going to need to treat businessmen different than students, right? We want different rules to apply to these two groups. So in addition to fair use, Congress set forth some educational guidelines in the legislative history around copyright. And so those guidelines generally get to issues of brevity and spontaneity and the cumulative effect. So if we keep all of these relatively low in education, we're going to be able to make some additional copies that we wouldn't have been able to make in a business setting. And so over the years, what has the definition of these three relatively simple and small concepts entailed? Well, uh, I'll give you this one. Here is the definition of brevity, which is, of course, anything but brief. <laughs> uh, and so you can see that over the years, this has become a very complex area for schools in determining just how much we are going to permit. How complex, you might ask? Well, here's an example of a policy out of a district in Louisiana that gives copyright guidelines for everyone in their district, the teachers, the students, and everyone else. So let's take a look at this thing. So you can see right at the beginning, we're going to talk about fair use. And OK, wow, this is long. Yeah, you get the scent, right? sense, right? So we're saying here's what's permitted and here's what's not permitted in this incredibly long document. This, of course, is one way to deal with copyright in education. It's a very complex way to deal with it. And for most school districts in the country, this is our current policy. We just keep writing more and more policy, trying to cover the schools, but in case anything ever happens. Okay, so where were we with our story about Mr. Lessig and adding a C to copyright? Well, he had a fundamental concern, 
And that concern was that the architecture has changed. And rather than me try to explain it in this podcast, it's just easier for you to go and listen to it. So go to your web address, hit pause right now, and then type in this web address. All right, so there you have some sense of the elephant in the room and that the underlying architectural changes of copyright have caused a fundamental shift in what we expect this to do. And so Mr. Lessig did something about it, as all good professors should do. That is our job. And so in doing something about it, he created a new architecture, right? And this is the architecture. The idea of universal access to research and education and culture is made possible by the internet, but our legal and social systems don't always allow that idea to be realized. And so copyright is created long before any of this, and it can make it hard to perform the actions we take for granted on the network. <clears throat> so the default setting of copyright law requires all these actions to have explicit permission, and that, of course, makes no sense. So to achieve the version of universal access, someone needed to provide a free, public, and standardized infrastructure that creates a balance between the reality of the internet and the reality of copyright. And so that's what Creative Commons does. Okay, it creates a de facto contract between an author and a reader that says as long as, dear reader, you do not make business, you do not make money off of this, you don't turn this into a business, and you don't uh, generally profit off of my work, you're free to use it and remix it and everything else as long as you give me attribution. Right? Simple. And so Creative Commons contracts wind up looking like this, and you can see that it's a quite extensive contract, but all of that can be summarized into these little circles, and so the main circle being the Creative Commons deed, right? That CC with a circle around it, this one. All right, so all of these sites are places that allow for Creative Commons sharing. And these are all extremely useful for education, right? And in fact, there's at this point around 500 million pieces of information that have been licensed under the Creative Commons license. And of course, that number is growing exponentially year over year. So that is the story of Mr. Lessig and how he dealt with the copyright issues inherent in our system. So that's the end of my story. My concern, of course, is regarding education and what copyright means for us in education. Specifically, I'm concerned that people like this, these students, are criminals under our current copyright law. I'm also concerned that folks like this, teachers, are criminals under our current copyright law. And ultimately, I'm concerned that schools like this one here in my town of Lexington, Kentucky, ultimately are liable for all of this criminal behavior taking place within their walls every single day. Right, and so where I work at the University of Kentucky, every day there's thousands of kids that are violating copyright law multiple times per day, which is extremely concerning. Now we need to be honest, though, that even though there's millions of violations occurring on a daily basis, very, 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 very few of these are ever being prosecuted in the legal system. So what we need to do here is come up with some common sense solutions to minimize the risk to copyright holders and minimize the risk to educational institutions while maximizing the learning opportunities inherent in those systems. And so to do that, I want to provide some tips. So tip number one, just ask politely. And I've done this in the past and it works pretty well. So the easiest way to get around copyright is to just ask for permission from the copyright holder. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and it usually takes a couple weeks. But if it's something important to your lesson, it might be worth it. Tip number two, if it's built for education, please don't copy it. There's a fundamental difference between Sony BMG, the music company, and Pearson Education. Pearson makes money off of the education system. Sony really does not. 
And so if it's something that has been built specifically for the education system by a company like Pearson, don't copy it because they're much, much, much more likely to prosecute against you. Tip number three, get your purchasing house in order. This especially goes for you education leaders out there. So number one, you need to know the state purchasing contracts and stay up to date with those. Okay, so in Kentucky, we have state purchasing contracts at the statewide level that cover a lot of our purchasing on software and stuff, such as our huge new purchase of Microsoft Live at EDU. But still, there are lots of particular purchases at the district level that are falling under contracts that are, technical, that are creating technical copyright violations frequently. And so this is an area that you need to be very careful with because we've already seen lawsuits in this area uh, Microsoft sued the Los Angeles School District and there was a settlement for millions of dollars um, that happened because My Los Angeles was making multiple copies of Microsoft products such as Word. Tip four, take stuff down. All right, so when you see violations happening, just take it down. If somebody asks you to take down a photo or a video or anything else that a student might have made, just take it down. The easiest solution here is really just to work with the students to, to take this stuff down. Now, there may be First Amendment implications, but from the school standpoint, it might be easier to have that fight than to try and fight Pearson or one of the big record labels. Tip five, advanced searching. So if I leave you with nothing else, I want to leave you with this. So on most search engines nowadays, and of course we're going to look at Google, there's advanced searching options, especially for images, that allows you to return usage rights that are filtered by license. Okay, so when you click that down, you can get licenses that are only for Creative Commons or free, freely available material. Tip number six, please use and promote Creative Commons. This is what I see as the ultimate solution for the education system, is we need to move to a Creative Commons regime. Most of the material in the education system that both we produce and that we use is really nothing that's going to make huge profits out in the industry. I mean, yes, once in a while we use a Disney video or something like that, but most of the time we're using stuff created by other teachers or stuff created by a university. All of that needs to be licensed under Creative Commons. So when you create material, license it through Creative Commons. And when you're finding material, please also look at Creative Commons material. Remember, there's 500 million assets out there licensed under Creative Commons, so I'm betting there's something that you can find useful. And ultimately, as you can see through our district policy, whoops, that that district policy was even licensed under a Creative Commons license. Tip seven, help us build. Um, so as we're building out all of our new assets for the education system. So this is one of the assets that I'm building because frankly I'm doing something like all professors should. I'm building out, helping to build out our new iTunes U platform for Kentucky and as we're doing that we're also building out free and Creative Commons licensed materials and we're putting them up on the web that are easily shareable across the state uh, where teachers can work together to get great material into kids hands. Finally, last tip common sense with the concept in mind. Remember, this is all about authors providing incentives for them to have more great ideas. Okay? So in the education system, we're interested in creating more great ideas. That's what the Constitution was interested in in the first place. So let's keep that common sense in mind and keep a general sense of when it's okay to use something and when it's not. And using a common sense approach is going to keep you out of trouble most of the time. <clears throat> so this concludes our podcast on technology and copyright. <clears throat> there are several ELA public... <clears throat> Pardon me. If you're a member of ELA, you might find additional information by logging into the SLR Express and searching by technology and copyright keywords. And I urge you to check out these additional resources if you're interested. I'm Justin Bathin, University of Kentucky. Thanks for listening.